about the words, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. Are you afraid? Another angel follows the first one, saying, Babylon has fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Do you find yourself attached to that great city? A third angel followed them, saying with loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his head or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. How drunk are you with that wine? In this series, I will be presenting sobering truths about God. Through the book of nature, we will be awakened out of our stupor. These, these truths will fit us not only for the judgment, but to give glory to God. Just as Moses needed country living to reshape his thinking, so do we. Now, our first talk in this series is entitled, Learning How to Think About the Creator. Observing nature and its competition for food, shelter, and space depicts cruelty for most people. Fighting over food, fighting for shelter and territory. Living creatures demonstrate a survival of the fittest picture for us to behold. The biblical account of a paradise of peace and harmony is a make-believe world compared to what nature films show us. The presenters of nature's activities select the violent behavior of creatures and often neglect the gentle, loving behavior also found there. The fidelity of geese mating for life. The sibling love of giant otters helping their parents care for their younger siblings. Geese coming out of a flock to stay with a sick or injured one until it can fly. The nurturing care of a mother for her young. These and many other act activities are lessons for us to love one another as Christ loved us. He was willing to give his life to redeem our lives. The full scope of nature's activities, from birth to death, should focus on the overall design of not just one creature's activities, but the communal cooperation everywhere present, a focus on symbiotic relationships that exist for every living creature will awaken us to a design that shows everything operating to serve all in their sphere of influence. Even the inanimate things behave physically and chemically in ways that assist living things in their need of food, habitat, and successful reproduction. Volumes of bio biology books can be written on symbiosis, and there would be no end in sight of compiling all the symbiotic activities. Because of the lie of evolution that all things came from nothing, as unreasonable as that is, coupled to the idea that only an ignorant person would contemplate nature as a design creation of a creator God, few dare look at nature with untainted glasses. Fear to be different guides most people. How is it with you? When I was in a class at college called Taxonomy of Angiosperms, the classification of the flowering plants of the world, I was first presented the line of evolutionary development of the flowering parts of plants. The Linnaean classification system I was about to be taught was based upon the order in which flowers developed from more primitive designs to more complex designs. Simply designed flowers on a single stem to complexities of flowers on varying inflorescences to giant composites like the sunflower with its ray flowers and disc flowers making up what appears like a single flower were portrayed as evolving from a leaf. The rolling up of a leaf and out of nowhere sexual parts beginning to develop that would later mate with one another to create a new life form was presented as truth with no questions asked. Having been trained from kindergarten through high school to believe what you have been taught or you will be ignorant spurred us on to believe what we were told. But when it came to the evolutionary graft of the continually evolving flower families from simple to more complex, I rebelled at the idea. 
I was told to believe a graph where 70% of it was left blank and the gaps were enormous. Although I did not know an alternative explanation for where we now have all these varying families of plants, I had never contemplated, contemplated a creator, creation by a god. Ridiculousness had gone too far for me to accept it. It was not until five years later that I was introduced to the God who takes care of our needs. Learning about him and that he created the earth and all that's in it still did not open my eyes to the proof that he made all things here on earth. I believe that by faith. The faith that evolutionists ridicule as ignorance. But I wanted more than faith. Science is hard, cold facts. I wanted the facts. Today... I really appreciate the magazine Acts and Facts put out by ICR, the Institute for Creation Research. True science is observation of what is going on here on Earth, not fanciful fairy tales. True science is observable. Although the passage of time with its changes in weather do not allow for anything to truly occur twice the same way, enough repeatable laws exist to settle the mind in peace that a designer made Earth. Our loving designer who gave us a peaceful planet where we have not marred it. With the Bible's true timeline showing us the devolution of mankind's habitat, a paradise home to a flooded earth, to an earth on the brink of ecological collapse, to an earth made new again, we can see where we fit into this story. I now see how our role of groundskeepers, Genesis 2.5, and gardeners, Genesis 2.15, has put us in charge of Earth's habitat. The dominion we have over our habitat, Genesis 2.6, to be able to subdue it, Genesis, I meant Genesis 1.26, and uh, this one, to the, and be able to subdue it, Genesis 1.28, has put all things in subjection to our actions. This leaves us with the choice to either to continue the degradation of Earth's landscape or the repair of the damage our activities have caused. Since the discovery of the epigenetic switches on genes that take environmental readouts and adjust the new cell accordingly, I have realized my ecological impact is not something to be taken lightly. I'm not just ruining my habitat when I break the ecological laws that maintain a paradise, but by the changed environment, I'm genetically modifying all living creatures as well as myself. This has been going on here on Earth since paradise was lost. The behavior of animals, we have changed from peaceful to competitive. There was food and habitat and healthful mates for all before we slowly but surely trashed Earth's ecosystems. All creation struggles to find food and habitat and healthy mates because we trashed God's ecosystem, which rewrote their genes to fight for survival. Genetic modification is not just using a gene gun to alter genes. It's not just creating mutations to alter genes, as was done with almost all the commercial wheat in the world today. It is not just by selecting hybrids to grow because of their vigor, even though there is a natural consequence of breeding out to inbred lines. Genetic modification is also the natural, God-designed modifying of the genetic pattern of any living thing by us altering the environment. When we change God's genetic design of any living thing, we are modifying it. Hybrid vigor is a modification in the right direction. When inbreeding has weakened the line, the open pollinated varieties are varieties that seek to maintain vigor in every generation. Our selection of seed from a crop must be wisely made or we can lose the purpose of food to nourish us. Food plants selected for color, size, shape, shippability, uniformity and ripening, ease of mechanical harvesting and other traits and other like traits while neglecting nutrient content negates the purpose of food. It's to nourish us. The genetic traits just listed are all right if nutrition is not compromised, but too often that's not the case. 
it is better to select for nutrition and seek to improve it by monitoring brick levels. Brick is a measurement of sugar content. Professor Bricks in Germany, over a century ago, devised a way to measure sugar content with a mechanical device. We all were given one by God to measure bricks, and that's our tongue. The sweeter the produce is, the higher the nutritional content. Of course, we have the exceptions of some plants producing chemicals that register sweet on our tongues but have little sugar in themselves. Think of stevia or chemicals in plants like sorbitols and amitols. Sugar content in plants is in direct ratio to mineral content, oil content, and quality protein content. As the sugar goes up, all these other factors have increased. The bottom line is minerals. When the plant can get all the minerals it desires, it can construct sugars, oils, fragrances, starches, and quality protein to its genetic potential. Not only can it reach its genetic potential, that genetic potential can increase year after year. When the plant's environment that we control is providing all the nutrients it desires, we will see how high it can go. Plant environment is not just necessary for food, good quality food to grow. Plant environment resets the gene pattern for blessing or for a curse. Our work on and in the soil and its effect upon the microbes feeding the plant is monitored by switches on our crop's genes. Environmental degradation leading to fewer microbes making fertilizer for the plant tells the plant scale back what it calls for from the microbes. The symbiotic relationship plants and soil microbes have is one where plants signal to the microbes their needs. Microbes like mycorrhizal fungi send signals out to their root-like structures to mine minerals from the rock and to get compounds produced by bacterial colonies to send to the plant's roots. Sugar energy made by the plant is moved out of the plant into the fungi. They use it for the work of mining minerals or to feed bacterial colonies that make plant nutrients. This serving relationship of plants gathering sunlight and using it to convert water and CO2 to sugar fuel to feed their microscopic partners shows us not only living things were designed to serve each other, but also how the inanimate elements and compounds and sunlight energies are designed to be of service. Every act of service seen in nature is Christ's voice teaching us innumerable lessons of God's love, his power, our need to submit to it, and our need to persevere following God's creation design. This is why in Testimonies, Volume 6, 178, it says, Nature's voice is the voice of Christ, teaching us innumerable lessons of love and power and submission and perseverance. Our paradise home was to stay a paradise. We were given the occupation to keep it that way. We were to serve the ground's microbial livestock. We were to plant the garden design God gave to Adam and Eve for their children's families. The earth was to be transformed by us to miniature Eden spread all over the earth for every family to raise their children in. You can read about that in Education, page 22. The lesson book of nature was to be studied in the schoolroom of our garden home. Here the true story of God would be seen. Here our creator ordained our role as students and his as teacher. You can read about that in Education, page 20. Many who look at nature are disturbed by what they see. We as Christians want to look at creation with eyes that see the truth. We want to understand God's design of all things as he wanted us to. All that God made was designed to show us his behavior, a maker of a paradise at peace that brings pleasure and delight for all living in it. He designed it to show a kind, loving, gentle designer, not a cruel designer who delights in competition and fighting. How we see things is more than just the use of our senses. Our minds can be trained in childhood to see white as black and black as white. Deceit and lies about a cruel designer of the heavens, the earth, 
and the seas and the fountains of water is gaining wider and wider acceptance. How can we explain what we read in the Bible with what we see today? Only by renouncing lies can they cease to exist. Like a parasite, they must have someone to cling to to stay alive. Truth has been ridiculed and belittled to the point where few want to proclaim it anymore. So, where do we get the power to renounce lies? The anointing of the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit leads us into all truth. In 1 John 2, 26-28, we have an important lesson to learn. John says, These things have I written to you concerning them that lead you astray. The anointing which you have received, and that's the Holy Spirit in us to guide us, of him that lives in you, such that you need not any man teach you. Notice we don't need a worldly education. The Holy Spirit will teach us all things, and is truth, and is no lie. And what he has taught you, stay with him on that. And now, little children, stay with him so when he shall appear the second time, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. John says, stick with God's program for our lives. Country living is God's schoolroom where Christ, nature's voice, teaches us all truth. Lies have seduced most people to believe we have evolved from nothing over millions of years, that there is no creator God. From this lie has sprung up untold wickedness. It says, life is one of competition for a place in this world. This lie has been crushing out the truth that a loving designer made a paradise for all of us, one that we're to keep up and expand upon. John's lesson for us is that if we're willing to live by the truths the Holy Spirit reveals to us, we will have God residing with us to lead us in everything we need to know. The prerequisite to being taught the truth when we have been deceived by lies is a heart willing to do what the Holy Spirit teaches us. John also said in John 7:17 7, and 18, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine or the truth, whether it be of God or whether it be from man. I speak of myself, or whether it be from man. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh God's glory that sent Christ, the same is true, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Jesus, our creator and redeemer, came and taught truth. He renounced lies by presenting truth. When he left, he gave us the comforter to lead us into all truth. He brought glory to the Father, to himself and to the Holy Spirit, glory rightly placed. Those that teach lies bring glory to themselves. They seek to deceive, whether purposefully or ignorantly, because they're glorified in the process. They claim to know what is truth, while the ignorant ones sit at their feet and believe whatever they're told. Christians speak truth to glorify God. They declare his goodness in giving us a paradise, his love in redeeming us, and his peace when one lets him lead in their life. This series will pre present truths about God's creation that have been muddied with lies. It will seek to purify the dirty water that people have been given to drink. That concludes my talk.